Yeah, it's intense. Yeah. It's intense. By the way, I love living in New York. I'll put up with anything to live here. I really like it here. Well, you're going to put up with something everywhere. That's true. You know, until you don't have to put up with anything. That's true. <laughs> Well, um, first of all, I wanted to, um, John Patrick Shanley is our guest on the podcast today. I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, thank, thank you for the for time. Your hospitality and having me. Oh, no, thank you for having me. I'm very excited. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, I have been a fan for a very, very long time as, a, uh, as an actor in New York. I think like many actors. We've been working on your material forever. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of go through the the whole library of stuff when we're in drama school, I guess, and work on, on so many different plays. So this is exciting. I appreciate it. We're going to talk a little bit about some of your plays, sure. if we could. And then we're going to talk about your new play coming up, mm -hmm. Candlelight, mm -hmm. which um, I read and is amazing. Thank so we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I just wanted to start a little bit about uh, maybe at the beginning um, where you grew up. I know you grew up in the Bronx. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about growing up in the Bronx and uh, the effect it had on your work, because a lot of your plays are, are set in the Bronx. And yeah, well, you know, in order to do anything as a writer, an artist, maybe as a human being, you have to come from someplace. You have to have your roots somewhere in something. And that is a lifelong place. You know, your experiences of childhood is a lifelong uh, resource that you can draw on and that you kind of need to get your bearings uh, no matter where you, you know, end up in your, your wanderings. Uh, I come from the East Bronx, East Tremont and Beach Avenue. Uh, and uh, I lived there until I was 19 when I went in the Marine Corps. I spent a couple of years in New Hampshire uh, when I was like... Uh, 15, 16, 17, uh, going to a private school. I ended up in when I got thrown out of all the schools in New York. <laughs> um, I grew up in a street corner society, which means I saw the same, let's say, 50, 75 people every day for like 15 years. Wow. Uh, and that continuity together with uh, an incredibly stable home life uh, gave me a rock solid foundation from which to view the world. There was a quote somewhere that said um, you were, and, uh, you said that it, it wasn't even true, but you had said something like that. I don't believe in you were at Catholic school and you said that you didn't believe in God and you got kicked out of school for that. Yeah, I was in uh, Cardinal Spellman in the Bronx and I was in religion class <laughs> and a brother who was a really curmudgeonly guy named Brother Henry, always like reeked of cigarettes and other things. Uh, he uh, uh, explained that if you were baptized, that you had implanted in you the seed of faith and that that was a, a lifelong thing. And I raised my hand and he called on me and I said, uh, I went to, I was baptized and I went to eight years of Catholic grammar school. This is my second year of Catholic high school and I don't believe in God. And you could, it was like an atom bomb <laughs> went off yeah. in the room. Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, after class, the, all the kids like rushed up to me and went, you don't believe in God? And I said, no, I believe in God. I was just giving him a hard time because <laughs> the guy's such a lousy teacher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, word got to, to the principal and uh, I was, you know, sent down there for that and other stuff. And they uh, threw me out. Uh, I was also failing all sex subjects and <laughs> other misunderstandings. Got it. I also read that you were doing stage manager work on plays. I was on stage crew. I was building stage crew. I was building scenery, and then I was on stage crew in the running of uh, the shows, uh, particularly this kind of magnificent production of Sereno de Bergerac, which people yeah. still were talking about when I went back to the school when I was fifty. Uh, wow. Uh, it, really it had been an amazing, beautiful, uh, I, you know, I've seen Sereno a number of times. It was the greatest Sereno I've ever seen by far. Wow. And I know I'm speaking through youthful eyes when I say that, but there was something special and magic about it. Would you say that's 
maybe that performance has made you made you want to get into writing or or uh, in some way the industry you know i was already writing oh uh, you were i was writing from certainly the time that i was 10 uh and uh i was certainly writing the whole time that i was a cardinal spellman and uh and ever afterwards i was a born writer i was i did not know about plays hmm. Uh, and uh, The Miracle Worker and Cerno de Bergerac, both produced by Cardinal Spellman High School, were the first two plays I ever saw, and they were both spectacular. That's interesting. Did anybody from those plays go on to become famous actors? No, the guy who huh. played the lead in Cerno could have. Hmm. But he was like a tormented visionary from another world who was only visiting us here. Uh, and after uh, he graduated from Cardinal Spellman, apparently he wandered the world as an itinerant seeker uh, uh, until he faded into obscurity, uh, into the fog of time. Into the fog. The fog is where I want to be. Um, actually, I, um, I, I wrote down a quote you said um, you said something about growing up in the Bronx. Um, you said, I was in constant fights from the time I was six. I did not particularly want to be. People would look at me and become enraged at the sight of me. I believe that the reason that they, I believe the reason was that they could see that I saw them and they didn't like that. That is correct. Yeah. What did you, what do you mean by the, they, they, they saw that I saw them, like for who they really well, you were? Know, I grew up in a place that was profoundly anti-intellectual and racist. Hmm. Uh, and uh, not as racist as like when I was a kid, my sister moved to Maryland and I went and visited her there a few times. And I was appalled by the racism that hmm. I heard coming out of the mouths of people in Baltimore uh, this is back in the early, very early 60s. Uh, I'd never heard anything like that. And I grew up in a neighborhood where people just hated black people and Latino people uh -huh. uh, and would physically attack them if they came into the neighborhood. And they were nicer than the people that I heard talking in Baltimore. <laughs> so, you know, it, but in more generally, there was like a, a, a feeling, a, a common a fallback position in my neighborhood among many people of like, well, I don't know about that and I don't need to know. And I'd just be looking at them while they said that. Yeah. And they could see their stupidity in my eyes, Got even it. if I didn't say anything, and they'd go for me. Got it. Uh, and so I was uh, more of a reactive fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the second to join the fray. Got but it. once in, I did the best I could. Yeah, more of a self-defense sort of situation. I'm not going to completely say that since in some <laughs> way, but the way that I looked at them was a provocation. <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. Um, that's a, a lot of Italian... Um, was your neighborhood, was there a lot of Italian people in your neighborhood? Yes. It, okay, so because there's a lot of... In an Irish and Italian and to a lesser degree Jewish neighborhood. Uh, and the Italians, uh, I would go, you know, and hang out at their houses. I am from a number of Italian-American friends. And uh, their houses were so different than my house. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, they would openly talk about sex. They actually seemed to be interested in the food they were eating being tasty. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in, involved in having clothing that they thought was attractive. None of this was going on in the Irish American household. Got the it. only thing that we had was talk. The talk was good. Mm -hmm. The clothes were not good. The food was not good. Uh, the sexuality was being, they trying to stamp it out at every opportunity. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, every culture has its repressions uh, and every other culture offers some kind of relief from those repressions. And the Italian American culture offered me significant relief from the Irish American repressions. Mm, interesting. Is that where a lot of the, uh, I guess, where you drew on for inspiration to write Italian American Reconciliation? Absolutely. And, and all of that Absolutely. Stuff? I mean, these were idiosyncratic households as well as colorful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I enjoyed the, the differences between us a lot. And I, yeah. in writing about love, uh, like in Italian-American Reconciliation or Moonstruck, uh, I was writing about 
uh, I was using the Italian American culture to free myself to write in the way that I wanted to write, to express myself in the way that I wanted to express myself mm -hmm. about romantic love. Yeah. And the neighbor, I think in the, the The wonderful thing about that play, I think, is you capture the neighborhood, the world, so beautifully. It's not just the characters, but where they are in, in like, just everybody in the neighborhood. You know, Aunt May has this really way, uh, this beautiful way of taking you into that world. I feel like that character, she's like the rock in, in a sort of a way and also, like, brings the authenticity of, like, that Italian community together and having, you know, having somebody like that yeah. around. And, and I mean, I think that children are born to love. Hmm. And they will love what they are given uh, as if they are allowed in any way. And one of the things that they are given is their circumstances. So children uh, tend to love where they come from. Uh, this can have incredibly negative consequences if you uh, are, are raised in a community that is xenophobic. Uh, and uh, you want to validate that community because you love it, because you're a child, then you're going to defend it very often in a lifelong manner, mm -hmm. uh, even if it enhances your blindness. Yeah. Well, speaking of love and that play, just selfishly, I have a question about the play. <laughs> um, Aldo, mm -hmm. um, in the play, obviously, Huey and Aldo are, 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 are best friends or very mm -hmm. close friends. And... Um, Huey was, was married to Janice. Mm -hmm. um, Aldo comes to him and sees that Huey is in this kind of crazy state and thinks that he's lost his manhood and the only way to get it back is to go back to Janice. Yes. And to get it because she, she says she, she took my manhood away or I forget exactly what it is. Aldo s decides to help his friend out even though he says he thinks it's a bad idea mm -hmm. uh, for him to get back to her. Mm -hmm. And so he goes there to loosen her up a bit mm -hmm. so that she doesn't kill him uh, kill Huey when he goes to show up yes now on working on the play because uh, I worked on that play um, I I had this idea but I wasn't sure if Aldo was going there selfishly for himself because he was in love with Janice I think that you know again children love you mm -hmm. know and so they were kids together and on some level uh, he loved her Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that he, I think that he, uh, you know, his plan is to this guy, his best friend, his, uh, uh, the guy's ex-wife is a holy terror. And the guy, uh, uh, his friend is uh, in a clinical depression with manic aspects uh, and thinks that the answer is to go back to his, his ex-wife. And his friend, uh, played by, uh, whose name is Aldo, uh, he hatches the plan of, like, he will save his friend by seducing the ex-wife first. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I think that he feels that Janice loves him. That she has attraction for him, and that's why she played all of these vicious games with him when they were children, uh, because she was always poking him. And right. whatever reason you poke somebody, if you keep poking them, usually means there's something, there's something there, there's something going right. on. Uh, I don't think that Aldo would ever uh, uh, intentionally break the heart of his friend. Got it. I think he's a very good-hearted person. And also, Al Aldo's a bit of a rube. Uh, he, uh, you know, likes to think of himself as an experienced uh, lover, but in fact, he's, he's really green and he doesn't really know very much about women. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was all these things when we uh, people would would say they um, they had these like thoughts that the the person that um, the woman that Aldo's talking to in the beginning at the end of the play was Janice, but it's not. No, right? Yeah, that's what I that's what I figured. Um, amazing, um, Danny in the Deep Blue Sea. Um, a play most young men <laughs> love to work on. I think we all feel like there's a bit of Danny in, in us um, in a lot of ways. Um, where did the where did the inspiration for those two characters come from? They are um, I don't even know how to uh, articulate. Um, uh, it seems like they're fighting themselves in a lot of ways. There's a lot of angst and a lot of um, stuff happening below the surface. 
and it's and it manifests in this rage and anger and this wanting to be um, a need for compassion and love and acceptance in a way. And it leads them to, well, Danny especially leads him, I guess he uh, also could be uh, how he grew up or whatever, but he he manifests it in violence in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, was there somebody that you knew growing up like, like that or, or um, how did that? Well, I grew up with a lot of people like that, and uh, and I was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I wrote the play, these were very much my feelings. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, the encounter that, that Danny has uh, that uh, haunts him, uh, that he was at a party of a guy named Skull, and that he attacked this guy, and he uh, was violent, and that he feared that he killed him. Uh, and I had that fight. I was describing the fight that I had wow. uh, in the play uh, in real life. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I didn't kill that guy. But mm -hmm. the only reason I didn't kill that guy is I didn't kill him. You know, right. we're, yeah. not, you know we're not responsible necessarily for positive outcomes uh, yeah. any more than we're necessarily responsible for negative outcomes. Uh, I also, I, I knew a lot of people who broke my heart because I got out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my neighborhood was not going to remain as it was. So uh, the place that I loved, uh, even with all of its flaws, was imploding uh, even as I stepped out of it into the Marine Corps to change the entire context of my life. Uh, and I never would really return. Uh, uh, and once I got out, I'd pulled the ripcord. Um, and a, a lot of people couldn't, didn't. Uh, and they were there. And the next act began to unfold, which I had foreseen would be largely dark uh, for them. And I got to see these beautiful young people go through the uh, meat grinder of facing being an adult with the very limited tools they have and the pain that they carried and the rage that they had. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wrestled with those same things, but I had gotten out mm -hmm. uh, and I found ways positive and negative to offset those things and to continue to grow. You know, I found that my anger, I found with audiences, surprised me when I did Danny, uh, that the audience loved my anger. They were like, "Go for it! Yeah. This is great," you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was shocked uh, and uh, uh, for a moment uh, appalled, and then uplifted because I'm like, "It's okay to be me." Yeah, with all of this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and I can use what I've gone through as the rocket fuel to take me to where I want to go. Wow, there's a when when we. <laughs> When we train with teachers on that play specifically, it seems like, and I wanted to ask you about this, it seems like everybody kind of says the same thing when approaching Danny. And it kind of drove me nuts because I always thought, I was like, it can't all, it doesn't have to be done this way. Does it have to always be done the same way? And every teacher, and it seems like even actors, when they discuss Danny, they're like, well, you know, it's got to be up here the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, does it really have to be up there the whole time? Like, I, as, as somebody that reads the play, and and and, and uh, I see a lot of different colors in different places, but a lot of times, most of the performances, and I know it's, it's as a result of you know everything that they've gone through, but they're almost screaming at each other the entire time. Well, you know, uh, first of all, there is no one way to do something. Second of all, some people have that size. They contain that size. Mm -hmm. And so it's legitimate. Right. John Turturro contained that size. Right. And so it was legitimate. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, uh, mimic uh, somebody who has that size. And I don't mean size simply as a positive, but right. it does mean a big person. Right. It means a person who has a whole solar system inside of them. Uh, with cold planets and hot planets uh, and a molten center. Uh, and uh, they, they can go and bounce off of all those different parts of themselves. And that's where the variety comes from. It's because they themselves are various. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, that's good to know.
Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, I was always curious because it was like, even when you talk to actors, like, oh, yeah, it's got to be up here the whole time. And I was like, well, I thought I'd just ask. Uh -huh. um, which one, out of all of your published plays, which one came first? Like, uh, which one was a, one, uh, out of the collection? Which one was your first published play? Uh, I would say uh, The Red Coat. The Red Coat. Mm -hmm. And w which play do you think was which the one? This is a one act. Mm -hmm. And which one was the one that you think kind of changed your career or changed Danny your... Danny in the Deep Blue. Danny in the Deep Blue Sea. Wow. No question about it. Wow. I, uh, I, I, I wrote Danny uh, and I um, got accepted into the National Playwrights Conference at the O'Neill in Connecticut. Uh, and the first thing that they did was they had all of the writers, like 10 writers, and then the directors assigned for those plays and designers and the artistic director was Lloyd Richards at that time. Uh, and you went into sort of a school room uh, and there was a desk in the front and then there was sort of school chairs and each writer in turn would get up and read their script to the group. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly one of the writers I remember from that was August Wilson reading Fences for the first time. And, uh, that, you know, that was pretty thrilling. And so then they asked me to do it, you know. So um, I got up and I sat down at the school desk, the teacher's desk in the front, and I started to read the play. And when Danny flips out, uh, not that long after the play begins, the entire front row of people listening, picked up their chairs and moved them back five feet <laughs> <laughs> to give you some idea of what was going on. Uh, and uh, it was very clear to me, first of all, I'd never been asked to read one of my plays out loud before. And you were reading Danny's play yourself? I read all the all plays. Of it. Oh, wow. you know, I was doing the play. And uh, I suddenly realized somewhere in there I'm, this is who I am. I am telling you for the first time in my life, I'm announcing who I am. I've been hiding it. Mm -hmm. And get ready because here it comes. And it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was thrilling. And after uh, everybody there just sort of closed in on me, they just, you know, they, they were drawn to it. Mm -hmm. And I knew something then. And then when I did it at Actors Theatre of Louisville with John Turturro and June Stein, uh, it was an international festival. Uh, and they'd uh, flown in. They had all this money from uh, the Humana Corporation. Uh, and they'd flown in uh, theater artists and producers and critics from all over the world wow. for this event. Uh, and uh, we... When we did the first performance of Danny, it was in a 300-seat house. And at the end of the play, the whole audience stood up and started cheering. Wow. And uh, it was my dream come true. It was like everything, every fantasy that I ever had about anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was weeping and other people, many people were weeping. And um, I've been very fortunate in that I have had like astounding moments of validation uh, periodically, often separated by years of silence. Uh, <laughs> and this was the this was this was my coming out party. It was just, it was just it, it was it was more than I ever could have hoped for. And uh, I remember thinking, "Wow, I did it! Mm -hmm. That thing that I've you know this was the goal of my life." I've done it. I'm 32. Wow. What now? And it must have been even more amazing because you were probably scared to death, as you were saying, because you're like, this is really me. I wonder how everyone's going to take it and for them to take it that well and, and, and celebrate it yeah. um, for being honest about who you were. I think from the first reading that I did for that very small group, mm -hmm. I knew something. Nice. I knew something. I knew it was going to be OK. Yeah. Do you work from the characters out or um, like when you or does it vary with every different play? Um, I'm writing a little bit now. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I wouldn't say I'm that very good, but um, I'm trying. And um, I, the hardest part is um, 
the hardest part is rewriting, definitely. But um, I always wondered, some people work from uh, a story and then, and then they build into the characters. Some people have these am amazing ideas for characters and then build a story around them. I was just curious as to. I, I've, I've worked in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, I would just describe uh, the setting mm -hmm. uh, for days. I, I would keep rewriting that. And I wouldn't allow any characters to enter wow. until they actually demanded to be let in. Uh, and that's how I would start a play. I would wow. choose a powerful room, powerful mm -hmm. to me, infused with a lot of history and feelings. And then and I would just describe it and describe it. And then finally, I'd let the characters come in. Uh, I recently... Uh, started a play that's not like anything that I've done. Uh, and it's something that I've been thinking about for many years, this particular premise, I guess mm -hmm. you'd call it. Uh, and But I'm like, I can't do it because I don't have a main character. I just don't have, I don't, I don't get who's at the middle of this thing. And then uh, I saw a video by an amateur dancer. And I looked at it and I went, that's it. That's the main character. And I was able immediately to start work. Huh, interesting. Uh, uh, every time, every time, I, certainly there's people that I can channel for days, you know, mm -hmm. people that I have known, and I know what they would say about anything you bring up, mm -hmm. uh, or I think I do. Uh, and um, those are, you know, those are certainly characters that I've, I've uh, employed from time to time, many different ways. But it's very interesting to come at it from a scenic angle, I think. I've never heard that before. That's amazing. That, that actually helps a lot just to think about that, because I, I feel like then it would, um, the characters would, you know, the idea of having the characters be invited into that setting in a way it just um i think it would be easier to even come up with the characters um based around the setting they're there you know yeah. the idea really of coming up with characters is uh misleading maybe because we contain multitudes as whitman would say and uh it is we don't recognize it you know we have mm -hmm. dreams every night you know everyone even if they tell you that they don't mm -hmm. dreams every yeah. night yeah. and it is a different reality than one we're experiencing when we're awake and those dreams contain characters uh very often they don't say anything or they say very little but they are a powerful presence that we contain uh i'm sure you know uh, if you have relatives that you grew up with uh, mother father sisters brothers and you know you were faced with let's say a a slice of apple pie. Mm -hmm. And now you'd say, you know, you like apple pie or not. But you could tell me mm -hmm. what your mother thought of that apple pie and whether she would like it or not. You could probably hear her voice saying what she thought about that apple pie. That's true. You can, and that is a voice, along with all these other voices you contain, that informs your day-to-day, moment-to-moment experience of life. All those, all those voices come correlate to you every moment of your life and you have to fight the you you for a place in that course and also pay attention to the voices yeah i find that most people have more trouble paying attention to their own voice than they do to hearing all those other voices. they can't hear their own they're drowned out by how much they hear wow. and that's a great thing once you recognize what it is yeah it's funny we're talking about uh, mothers and grandmothers i was watching uh, Moonstruck not too long ago um, another amazing film um, and there's a line in that film that gets me every time I watch it and it's because it reminds me of my grandparents and um, I, I, f I forget her name Julie Bavasso. Bavasso Julie Bavasso she's in bed and her husband is standing by the like a window or something and she stands up like a, just slightly and she says you know something um, standing there in that light with that smile on your face, you look, you look 25 years old mm -hmm. or something like that. It's such a beautiful line and so beautifully delivered. And I remember, and then his reaction is also so beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, I mean, just both that little, that little section is just like, I'm like, wow, beautiful line, beautifully acted by both of them. And it just took me to another place also. And 
it reminded me of the the pure love that my grandparents had, mm -hmm. just a very very pure love. And now that you you're, you're mentioning, we have all these voices of other people in our head. I could I was thinking, yeah, I could imagine my grandparents saying something, and it would probably be uh, something mm -hmm. that I could pull from. Yeah, you know, uh, Odysseus uh, when uh, he goes uh, to the entrance to Hades and he talks to the ghosts. Uh, one by one, they drink from the cup of blood he was instructed to offer them. Uh, uh, we all uh, get to talk to those ghosts. We have conversations with them every day. Mm -hmm. Moonstruck, how did that change? Did that change the trajectory of your career even more? Um, after yeah, I that? mean, you know, that's a different kind of success yeah. uh, in that, uh, you know, I had worked uh, almost exclusively in theater till that point. Uh, and uh, uh, and also, you know, the amount of the number of people who saw Danny in the Deep Blue Sea. I mean, I made five thousand dollars in royalties from Danny in the Deep Blue Sea in its first run. Well, you know, it's just you know, small theater, mm -hmm. bunch of people come, but not that many people. Right. And then you know, the play closes after I don't know two months, three months, and then on with the you know the next thing. If if you did that and did nothing else in a year, nobody would ever think of you again. Right. Uh, and then you do Moonstruck, and it is a global hit. Mm -hmm. uh, then. You know, you you're fa and you can never comprehend that. You never understand that. But yeah, no. Then I, you know, I started to make uh, a lot more money, and I uh, uh, ended up, you know, directing a, a big film, Joe versus the Volcano, with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, and produced by Steven Spielberg and Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall, uh, and had that experience. I keep getting to have experiences that I didn't particularly uh, think that I would ever get to have. You know, they mm -hmm. seemed like pipe dreams. I didn't particularly want to direct a movie. I wasn't mm -hmm. interested in it. I didn't even go to the movies that much. Uh, and then I was faced with uh, poverty. And I'm like, okay, well, then I guess I better go into this medium. And then once right. I started to investigate, I'm like, well, this is a really interesting way to tell a story it's different and i like it i like to use these materials because there's stories i'd like to tell that i can't tell in a play form right. i need i need another way to do that and so that opened up a, a lot of artistic doors in me of different ways to write about things which provided ventilation for me from theater because if you just do theater and do theater and do theater that becomes a trap too yeah. Um, do you have a favorite piece of work that you've written, whether a play or or um, or a film, like something that you um, is probably more special than any of the other ones? I don't know. You know, I mean, it, it, you, these memories get colored mm -hmm. by the reception. Right. Uh, and uh, I I remember thrilling moments, like when I did the dress rehearsal an invited dress rehearsal for beggars in the house of plenty. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most exciting things I ever did. That was in a 99 seat house uh, and Dana Ivey and Laura Linney uh, and, uh, and John Tenney uh, and Lauren Dean uh, and Daniel Von Bargen. And it was electrifying. That's the only word I can use for it. And the, I was using techniques I hadn't used before. I was writing about my family. I was, uh, this, the Santa Laquasto did the scene design and did this especially brilliant uh, job. Uh, and it all, it came together and it was a thrilling uh, achievement, really. Mm -hmm. And achievements are things that happen on a day. You know, uh, winning the Academy Award was an achievement that I had on a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go on, you know, you, you climb to the top of the mountain, you go like, I'm at the top of the mountain. And then you go like, OK, I got to go down now. Yeah. <laughs> What's the day after the Academy Awards like? It's sort of like that. <laughs> well, it's kind of aimless. <laughs> I, always, I always think about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I wonder, because that day is so big. I wonder what the next day is like. Oh, it's just aimless, yeah. you know? <laughs> I remember a photographer came to me the next day. I was staying at the Chateau Marmont. He came to me the next day and said, I wonder if I could take a picture of you with the Academy Award. I said, okay. 
And so we went down to the swimming pool. And I think I was like sitting on the diving board or something. And he took a picture. I'm not sure I ever saw the picture. Hmm. I heard that it was up on the wall of the Chateau Marmont for many years after that, until hmm. their refurbishment, I guess. Uh, and But it was, I was like, okay, somebody gave me something to do because I got nothing to do. To <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so funny. A lot of calls, I'm assuming, after that started to come in to direct more things or? Um... Um, uh, well, actually, no, it was writer skill strike. Oh. Wow. So I couldn't work. Huh. Which might have been a mercy, yeah. you know. Uh, Spielberg called me. I didn't know at all. He called me out of the blue. He said, "Hi, is this John Shanley." I said, "Yeah." He said, "This is Steven Spielberg." I'm like, "Oh, well, <laughs> nice to meet you." If only on the phone. Uh, and he said, "You know, I read this screenplay you wrote, Joe versus the Volcano. I think it's terrific." I said, "Well, thank you." He said, "I understand you want to direct it." I don't remember ever saying that. I said, uh, "Yeah." And he said, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and I was like, I hung up the phone and I said to my wife, I think my life just changed. And boy, oh boy, was that a big job. Woo. Wow. Amazing. I was actually, um, that's amazing. Um, I was at the Lincoln Center um, a couple of years ago and I was watching, I, I was working on, uh, I think it was Long Day's Journey in Tonight or something in class. And I was standing at the uh, desk because, you know, you can go and watch plays there. There's mm -hmm. a room and you can go and sit there. And um, I was standing there and I had the play in my hand and there was a gentleman, gentleman standing beside me. And he looked down and I guess he saw the play in my hand. I said, oh, are you, are you watching Long Days? I said, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh, what version are you watching? I'm like, oh, the Philip Seymour Hoffman version. He's like, oh, cool. I directed that. <laughs> And it was Robert Falls, I think his name is. Bob I, Falls. Yeah. And he was standing right there and he was like, yeah. I, I was like, why would he talk? He's like, yeah, I directed that play. And it was so crazy. Mm. Um, and he sat behind us. He was it was me and uh, my scene partner. And he sat right behind us. They were watching. He was watching something else. But he would check in every once in a while. And then we uh, he was very sweet and very nice. But we started to talk about Philip Seymour Hoffman, mm -hmm. which is what I wanted to talk to you about um, working with him. What was that like? He, Robert Falls said that... Um, he walked around with this overwhelming sense of like, um, like uh, I don't know, like it, like nothing he was doing was good enough or something like that. He just had that on him at all times. I don't know if that was during the play or what it was, but I just wanted to see because uh, I I adore him. I, uh, he's one of my favorites, and uh, I loved. I, he was amazing in that play as well. Amazing in Doubt. Um, I just wanted to know how what was it like working with him on that film. Well, I knew I knew Phil for years before that and we'd been on vacation together i knew his in effect wife and children uh and uh we were in the labyrinth theater together mm -hmm. uh for some years uh and um you know he's a he was a fascinating guy he was not a he was not a happy guy Mm -hmm. uh, when I knew him, when I worked with him, there was a heaviness yeah, that's in what him. Said, yeah. uh, it's funny, it's, uh, Bob Fultz said that you know, he sensed that Phil never thought he was good enough. Uh, because I, I remember listening to Phil telling Ron Cephas Jones, who's a wonderful black actor who's doing a lot of, getting a lot of work now, uh, you're good enough, you know? And it was one of the first times I heard that expression. Uh, and I thought, what an odd thing to say. I guess mm. that's a, anybody was saying was, you don't have to do anything. You're good enough. Who you are is good enough. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, and I might well be wrong. I didn't feel like that was what was in Phil's head. Mm -hmm. I, uh, at the time, I, you know, I, I misunderstood basically everything. So I thought that, you know, I was doing Doubt with Phil, the film, uh, and I said, you know, if acting made me this miserable, I wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. you know? He just seemed so miserable to me. Yeah. Um, and um, he sort of chuckled mirthlessly uh, and said, yeah, or something like that. <laughs> but what I came to realize later when he tragically died was that Acting was the thing that was saving his life. And, and, it, and it was just barely doing that. That, that, yeah. that the demons were elsewhere. Uh, and the acting was 
the good news, I guess, you know. Um, but definitely, I'm putting words in his mouth. I, I, you know, I do know that he carried a terrible burden and that he worked very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and that for the most part, I left him alone. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember, though, we were doing one scene and we were rehearsing it on set and uh, he was dissatisfied. And he, and he, cause he, and I, I knew about Phil is like, don't, don't direct this guy, leave yeah. this guy alone. <laughs> He's not, it, he, it will not go well. Yeah. Uh, and I also didn't feel the need. But then in this scene, he was like, are you like, is that good? Is that, you know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but there was something in my voice. And he said, I said, yeah, most of it. He's like, where's the part that it, and I said, well, when you go over to the window, it's a little fudgy there. And he said, yeah, well, uh, yeah. They, and he, they, then he, you know, we collaborated for a few <laughs> minutes uh, and we got it. And he was like, okay, now I got that missing piece of how I get from the, uh, and, um, and then on another uh, more central occasion, I uh, had rehearsed it for a couple of weeks in a rehearsal room with the cast. And then we were on set and we did a rehearsal for, uh, with, uh, with lighting of the big confrontation between him and Meryl Streep. Uh, I watched it uh, on the monitor uh, and I said, and I realized it didn't work. Uh, and I went over to Phil and we would, had done it, he was confronting her and he was behind this desk and she was on one side of the desk and he was on the other and the confrontation took place. Uh, and he was in a chair and she was standing up. And I went over to him, I said, it, it, uh, it, 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 you're gonna have to get out of the chair, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And he said, that's what we rehearsed. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know, <laughs> I know but it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And he said, all right. And then he, I said, you're going to have to come out from behind the chair. And, you know, like, I think for a lot of people, they go, well, what's the big deal, yeah. right? But when you're an actor and everything is based on action, on motivation, on why I do things, mm -hmm. this becomes like a big deal. And also this is the most important scene in the film for him. Uh, and um, he said, okay. And so we rehearsed it again. And he came out from behind the desk like a truck going out of control. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's great. We're, that's what we're going to do. And then Roger Deakins, my legendary cameraman, who was mostly monosyllabic and very charming at the same time, uh, he said, oh, oh. And he turned to his crew and he said, totally different fucking idea <laughs> it started tearing down <laughs> did he not get it in the shot oh no 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 oh, that was in, rehe oh, was in rehearsal, rehearsal. Got, it, got it got it that's oh. when roger realized he's gonna have to relight the whole got scene it, got it that's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> and what was what was meryl streep like working with her meryl is like uh um uh, a hard working keep to herself um always does the right thing to the point of that would make me suspicious of a person. Uh, um, and she, uh, uh, you know, very, you know, we were in rehearsal and uh, uh, at a certain point in rehearsal, um, she's like over by the donut table, I'll call it. And she's looking at the ceiling and she said, I don't really know what rehearsals are for. <laughs> and I knew that was for me. Uh, um, and, oh my goodness. And uh, I, my reaction was to talk about uh, the monkeys of New Delhi. I launched into a thing about the monkeys of New Delhi for about 30 minutes. Uh, Just, you had visited New Delhi? Never been. Oh. <laughs> Read about it, <laughs> read about it. And the, the uneasy relationship between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom as evidenced by the monkeys of New Delhi. So and the reason, it was instinctual, mm -hmm. and the reason I did it was 
I'm not going to talk about what you just said. You right. know. I am going to demonstrate that I'm very intelligent. <laughs> and I'm going to do it for long enough that maybe you'll forget <laughs> that your previous impression of me might have been slightly erroneous. And we can, you know, do a rehearsal that has, bears fruit for us all. And I did that. I don't know if it worked, but we did get on very well after that. Yeah. Uh, and I described afterwards the collaboration because we would sit around and uh, uh, Meryl knitted. So she's dressed all in black and a bonnet, the whole thing. And she's knitting, right? And Amy Adams, she's dressed all in black and the bonnet. And after a couple of days, she starts knitting. She takes it up. Right. So now I'm and I'm reading the New York Times. So we sit, we're sitting in the middle of the set while they're lighting and everything. And I'm reading the paper and these two women dressed in black are knitting just like the fates. Yeah. Uh, and uh, incredibly quiet. I very rarely spoke. Uh, I never like deeply engaged because I knew they were working. Right. That's when they're working. You yeah. Know? Uh, and they knew that. And I described it afterwards. I said, it's kind of like slow dancing. You know, it's just, it's very intimate. It's very quiet. And it lasts for the time that it lasts, which is forever and a minute at the same time. Mm -hmm. Amazing. That sounds great. That would have been nice to be a fly on that wall. Um. <laughs> it was kind of the first AD hated us. He's, he's like, why doesn't she go to her trailer? You know? <laughs> Well, that brings us to something that you have written um, recently. Um, actually, I don't know when you it might have been recent or not, but it's a play that um, uh, you uh, wrote and now is being uh, put up, uh, I believe, in November this month coming up. Are you guys in rehearsals now? Yeah, uh, the play is called Candlelight, and I wrote it this past winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're in rehearsal now, and it's going really well. I couldn't be more pleased with the cast. It's about uh, two New Yorican kids uh, in Bushwick who are 10 years old and who, as I describe it, fall into something deeper than love mm -hmm. uh, with comic and explosive and romantic and tragic results. Uh, and it's... Um, a phantasmagorical play. Uh, Definitely. Elements that are uh, maybe reminiscent of Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, mixed with Lorca. Uh, and, there's a little uh, bit of Romeo and Juliet. There's a balcony there's a, scene. There's a, there's a whole lot of references to Romeo and Juliet <laughs> yeah. in there as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, uh, I've not done anything like it before. Yeah. And yet I think you would recognize it as being of a piece with my work when you see it. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased with the, uh, the scenes. The scenes, every scene is interesting to me. Uh, and I don't get tired of it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it terrifies me because uh, the like, opening couple of scenes of the play are close to impossible. Hmm. Uh, I'm asking the director and the actors to do impossible things. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they're doing it. Uh, so that's sort of cool and interesting. Uh, I definitely, you know, when I, I've been, I was in rehearsal with them the other day and I was making some line changes. And I, I said, I'm making these line changes about making these characters speak in a more naked and naked and sincere and sincere way. And I said, you know, sort of my job is to get all the way right up to the edge of really bad, because that's where the good stuff is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what we've been doing. Uh, and they've shown uh, almost uh, reckless willingness um, to go there with me. Beautiful. I'm sure it's going to be really, really good. Um, I was reading it, and <clears throat> the there are moments in the play that um, items, household items, um, start to speak. And I, you personified uh, various things. It, it, it reminded me a little bit of when I was reading it, sort of like... Um, 
kind of in um, what is it? The, uh, is it the Beauty and the Beast? Is it maybe that sometimes it, yeah, Beauty and the Beast a, a sort of situation? I was wondering, is that in the character's head? Are they dreams or are they manifestations of what's happening inside? I guess I'm an animist, okay, uh, and so actually I do think everything's alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, in effect, physicists would agree with me. Uh, everything's in motion, including us. Mm -hmm. Nothing is discrete, mm -hmm. uh, one thing from another. Nothing is separate from another thing. There are these things called neutrinos that go like a wind through the universe. And when they get to us, they just go through us, too. Uh, and so, like, uh, we're sitting here talking, and these neutrinos are going through the back of you, out the front of you, into me, and out the back of me, and continuing on their merry way mm -hmm. through planets and God knows what. Uh, and which means we're actually all a, a single unity, uh, and that uh, this uh, collaboration uh, uh, we call humanity uh, is, in fact, a single being uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, has a fractured consciousness. Uh, broken up into myriad pieces that reflect off each other in positive and negative ways. Uh, and that, uh, so for me, for a chair to talk, mm -hmm. they are talking. Mm -hmm. They're going through me. They're changing what I say next. I see. They're in the conversation. Mm -hmm. I couldn't push them out if I wanted to. Hmm. Interesting. And the, um, the title, Candlelight, um, what is that, where did that come from? Uh, well, how did you come up with that? I have a, and I think many people do, such a consoling feeling about candlelight. Um, and I, you know, I have a little cottage on a mountain in the Catskills that I go to from time to time. And in my bedroom, uh, by the bed, I have uh, a single candle stub that after I turn off the lights to go to bed, I light that and I always have a sort of long moment alone, just me and the candlelight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, candlelight is a great metaphor for consciousness uh, and that uh, it's ignited and that at a certain point it goes dark, an individual consciousness. Uh, and that during the time that it's lit, we have power over everything, everything. Mm -hmm. We uh, we have the stars, we see them, the ocean, they belong to us. Everything belongs to the individual fleshy self because it passes through. It's the only way you can own it, understand it, experience it, even know that it exists. Uh, and all of that is a kind of candlelight. And in, and in addition to that, it's romantic, it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, it it provides so much illumination and yet the slightest violence and it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it reminds me of sort of what it is, the experience of being alive. It's like candlelight. Hmm. And w the decision to make the characters, because um, the, there's three characters who are children. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the decision uh, behind making them 10 years old? Was there a specific reason for that? Well, a couple of different things. One is, uh, I went to a party one time many years ago mm -hmm. uh, filled with famous people. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a young girl wandering around in this party. She was 10 years old. And uh, after talking to several uh, luminaries, I found myself talking to this 10-year-old girl. And she was the smartest person at the party. <laughs> She had it more together than anybody at that point. <laughs> and uh, uh, I never met her again. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I found out many, many years later that she was Mike Nichols' daughter. Oh. Uh, and, uh, but what I came away with was, wow, it's such a shame that girl's going to go through puberty. She's got it so together. If we had like a lot of people like her, the yeah. world would be an incredible place. Yeah. Uh, but she's going to have to go through this almost lifelong upheaval we call puberty. Uh, and the, she's right now approaching the meridian. Uh, and so that she's learned a great deal. She has a great deal of sophistication, but she hasn't yet to be completely unhinged by hormones. Uh, and I thought, well, that's, a, that's an interesting moment in life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted 
And also, I don't believe that there is anything but childhood. I think the distinction called adulthood is uh, 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 artificial. Uh, and I agree. And we, we, we're children, uh, and then we die. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of what's going on. And so I wanted, I know that the if I cast adult actors, that they will have at their disposal their whole childhood, mm -hmm. and they will have the 10 years old, and they will know about the future, the dangers to come for them, the heartbreaking things they're going to have to go through. And so why would you ever leave 10? Cling to it every moment of it that you can. And actors get to travel through time and space and be things that they are currently not, but that they once were or will be someday. Uh, and so these actors get to be 10 and now at the same time, which is a third thing. Hmm. And that's what I want for the audience. I have no interest in, uh, first of all, there's adult themes in this that I don't particularly want children to have to act out. Uh, and second, it, the, it's about the relationship to the audience. And adult actors are going to be able to re relate to the audience in a different way than a child would. And I want that. The... Um in, is in the in the play it seems it does seem like the children actually do have it more together than the adults that are that are in the play haven't you seen that for the most part yeah kids are always like you know daddy can't we just go to the park while daddy's burning down the house yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true um what message do you want people to take away from the play once they go and see it i think that you know whatever people take you know what people think when they like see one of my movies or plays or whatever, and then they tell me afterwards what they took away. Mm -hmm. I never could have come up with it. You <laughs> yeah. know? They're like, oh, that reminded me of my Uncle Billy, you know, because you know, he used to have a teapot that looked just like the one that that woman was using in the yeah. seat. And I'm like, okay, yeah, know, yeah. great, you know? Yeah. So, um, I, but I do think uh, that uh, the audience will, you know, like migrate thing when I go to a play is I sit there before the play starts and I am miserable and hopeful. I'm miserable because I'm like, this is probably just going to be predict. I'm going to know in five minutes everything that's going to happen for the next two hours or however long this thing is. Mm -hmm. But what if it's that other thing mm -hmm. where uh, it's just new somehow? Yeah. Uh, and I am hopeful. I think it will be true that the audience will not be bored. And I think that that's a big thing, uh, a rare thing. And that they'll go like, oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't really seen this before. Yeah. No, it's, it's very different um, than anything um, of yours that I've ever read. But at the same time, very much within the language style of mm -hmm. your writing, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited to see it on the stage. I think it's going to be really, really awesome. Yeah, Looking forward yeah. to it. Um, well, I appreciate your time, uh, Mr. Shanley. Uh, before we go, mm -hmm. uh, any advice to up and coming writers um, who are maybe just getting started or struggling with something, um, anything that you think would help somebody um, just uh, along their journey with writing? I would say just keep going. Ignore mm -hmm. your feelings. Ignore your feelings. Your feelings are squalling children in the back seat while you're trying to drive the car. So you, you hear them, you say, you put up with them for as long as you can, yeah. and you go like, all right, shut up. We're, you know, I'm not going to go any further until you just be quiet. Yeah. Uh, and, and I say that not because I, don't want, I want you to write emotionally dead things, mm -hmm. but because your feelings will fuel what you do no matter what you do but uh, very often you know these voices will come into your head this is no good I'm going to stop it stinks I, just, I don't know why I ever tried this I'll never be any good it, nobody will ever do this but, and all of that is just gets in your way it has nothing to do with anything and you're going to fail a lot and failure is fine. You can call it failure. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Just keep going. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, the fires, the buildings, all of that, the falling down, the earthquakes, the cracks that open in the earth, they're all right behind you. So you got to keep going. Mm -hmm. You don't stay 
in the disaster movie. You just stay one step ahead of the disaster movie, and eventually you'll probably get somewhere. I've noticed that anybody who sticks with it mm -hmm. eventually gets somewhere. Stick with it. Stick with it, and then you'll get somewhere. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time and looking forward to seeing Candlelight. Appreciate well, it. I, I much appreciate talking with you.